Luis de Bermejo, I guess I'm, I guess I'm best known for a book called Joker. Came out um, four years ago. Yeah. You want to tell us any of your other books? Uh, I yeah, I've done um, uh, mostly work for DC Comics. I did a book about Lex Luthor. Um, I also did I've done a Batman graphic novel that I wrote and drew. And um, most recently, I did uh, both the Four Watchmen mm -hmm. stuff. I did a book called Rorschach, Brian Esrella. Worked a lot with Brian Esrella. And you do a lot of covers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you I did a run on Hellblazer? And, uh, yeah. Do Do you consider yourself a cover artist, or? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, you know, I prefer doing sequential stuff. But mm -hmm. I think when you're slow and you know you're. you're um, American comics, at least, you know, they tend to throw a lot of cover work at you because they just assume that that's you know, you're going to hit those deadlines, you may not hit the other deadlines. So, but I, I really do prefer doing sequential huh. you know, story story stuff. Yeah. So, how did you get into comics, like reading them and stuff? Um, I guess I started reading Batman, Superman, Spider-Man comics. You know, probably like anybody else when I was a little kid. My mom was buying me buying me some of those books. Um, but as a kid, I was really into the Batman TV show, yeah. and that, I thought that was really, you know, I didn't, I took it totally seriously. I didn't get that it was like camp at all. I, to me, it was totally serious. Mm -hmm. And I think I was more interested in that, really, than the comic books for a while. Um, and then, uh, I guess it was when my family moved to California. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in the Midwest, and there weren't any comic shops in the town I lived in. There was a Hallmark with like a rack. I remember I'd buy, occasionally buy comics, but it wasn't really until I found a comic shop that um, kind of introduced me to the world of comics. Like, mm -hmm. at that point in time in the late 80s, Killing Joke was just coming out, Howard Shaken was doing Black Hawk and The Shadow, um, and all of a sudden there was this kind of new world of comics that opened up to me, where before I was literally, I mean, it was like, oh, Crisis on Infinite Earths or you know, Detective Comics. That was very standard kind of uh, superhero fare. And I started discovering other stuff, American Flag, really the Howard Shaken. Um, yeah, really like Wastelands and that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of DC early suggested for mature readers books. Um, and um, that really kind of blew my mind up when I started paying attention to certain artists, you know, Bill Sienkiewicz and Kyle Baker. Those people that I was gravitating to even at that, at that point in time. And then, um, I guess when I turned 13 or 14, it was kind of a big image comics boom. <laughs> and uh, for some of my age, that was perfect, you know? It was like, um, it was weird, because I went kind of went from one extreme to the other. I went from kind of, you know, following these kind of, uh, you know, non-superhero mainstream books to getting really into that image comic stuff. And it was really just the visual power of it, I think. Mm. And, and, you know, the hype and everything at that mm -hmm. point in time. Um, but yeah, so then I started doing, collecting image comic stuff and copying, I was always drawing, mm -hmm. but you know, copying um, specifically a lot of those early, early image books. Although I did get in trouble at school for copying the cover to American Flag, number one, first <laughs> comics edition. They wanted to suspend me for that. Really? Some girls in lingerie kind of posing, okay. scantily clad women yeah. posing around yeah. the flag. <laughs> But that's what I, where I kind of started drawing comic mm -hmm. books was around that period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how did you get into the industry? That was a little tricky. <laughs> I, was, um, I was lucky growing up in Southern California that I could go to WonderCon and, and San Diego Con every year. Mm -hmm. I mean, back when San Diego Con was way different than, you know, 93, I think, was my first San Diego Con. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. It was, uh, I was taking stuff around, I think from the very, no, maybe not the first year, but the second year I went, 94, 95, I started, mm -hmm. you know, consciously trying to show work. So you're doing portfolio reviews? Yeah, 15, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, started doing, when I was about 15, taking um, sample pages around. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at that point in time, like most young guys, I didn't understand why they weren't giving, giving me work. I thought, you know, my mom tells me I'm really good. <laughs> You know, why, why are these guys, uh, why are these guys being so hard on me? I remember a, a, a Wildstorm editor, uh, will go unnamed, I remember he, he was 
pretty straight up with me, and I think it was a good thing. I think at the time it just crushed me, but you know, he was really telling me the right thing to, that I, I, I telling me something I needed to hear, but just in the wrong way. Because mm -hmm. he was like, "Look, you're, you're 15. I can't give you work anyway. You know, you're not ready, but I, I can't give you work anyway." And um, and so I, you know, after that and the couple years that followed, I was just assuming, "Oh, well, they're not going to." work until I'm 18 so mm. I guess I'm just gonna show work to other artists mm -hmm. and um, that's what I started doing I just mm -hmm. started going around bugging artists like Tim Bradstreet and you know guys like that to mm -hmm. you know review my, my portfolio <laughs> and so um, yeah eventually you know years and years of, mm -hmm. of that and um, you know the stuff kept kind of getting better and better and better and Eventually, I, um, I met two different editors from Wildstorm, who were working at Wildstorm at the time. Uh, Scott Doombeer and Jonathan Peterson, who both um, kind of took me under their wing a little bit and, and was like, here, you know, here's my phone number, here's my address. You can send stuff directly to me instead of mm -hmm. sending, you know, there's no internet, no email at that point in time. So sending away sample pages, photocopies, was like sending a letter to Santa Claus, really like, you know, there's, you were never sure if anybody was ever going to even open that mm -hmm. packet, mm -hmm. you know. And I would take care and like go to Kinko's and like pay for laser copies, you know, at the time, which was like, you know, whatever, two bucks, three bucks a coffee or something like that. I wanted like, you know, I took all this time to create these packets of these, you know, three or four sample pages. And, um, mm -hmm. and eventually those guys were kind enough to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, give me the phone number and address mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. say, okay, you know, just send it you know, straight to me, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk on the phone. We'll go over, we'll go over the pages, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's eventually how I got in the door was, uh, at Wildstorm, pretty much through those guys, because they had an intern department that was um, really unique, I think, in comics. There's nothing like it now, mm -hmm. and I'm not really sure anything similar to it existed before. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what, what Wildstorm had was they had an apartment two apartments at one point in time and uh, Jim and um, you know I think it was mostly Jim responsible for hiring the guys was bringing young kids you know 18 19 years old and um, they were you know paying us very little but we, we were living in this apartment not far from the studio in, in La Jolla in San Diego and the cool thing was is that you basically were not quite working professionally because they weren't giving you comic book work but you were coming to the studio and drawing sample pages and stuff mm -hmm. at the studio mm -hmm. so it was a great environment because you know you had um well, jim wasn't working there at the time but you know you guys like travis and jeff campbell who were there mm -hmm. uh you know, working at the studio so that's that's what i did i got i got they hired me for like six months and um if, if it wasn't yeah. comics pages what what were they needing these this kind of art for trading what how are they cards they were having us do okay. trading cards they're having us do toy designs okay they were just throwing little odd jobs at us mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and eventually they um they had this licensing division mm -hmm. wildstorm this consumer products division mm -hmm. which is oddly enough it was run by all the guys who run idw now um, and they were throwing you know, like we would get license, like the Resident Evil license. Mm -hmm. So they started doing the Resident Evil magazine. <laughs> and, you know, that's what we started doing. The interns started drawing those stories. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, so it was a great, great you know, learning experience. It was a lot different. You know, when I talked to other guys' experience, specifically, you know, breaking into comics, mm -hmm. almost no one has that, that mm -hmm. experience. So I, I consider myself pretty lucky that I was able to kind of get in at that time, mm -hmm. specifically at my talent level because I mean I, it was like no way I could have done professional work at the time. I think they must have seen something there but that early stuff I was doing was just dreadful, wretched, wretched stuff. So I mean, you know, I, I, I consider myself lucky that I was able to kind of burn through a lot of those bad drawings yeah. in, uh, in a kind of secure environment. You know? uh -huh. Uh -huh. So did you have a day job at this time or? No. Okay. So no, they, they were paying me. Yeah. Not very much but I mean you know, like at that point in time, we, we were, you know, we were living in this apartment with mm -hmm. you know, four or five other guys who mm -hmm. were all around the same age, mm -hmm. um, new guys who were all pretty passionate about doing comics. And, um, not real, not a lot of living expenses if they had your place no, and gave you a little money. Chinese food, <laughs> you know, like it was just, 
just, uh, it was a college experience for me. It was my college experience. It was like living in a dorm and going to school, you know? Mm -hmm. You're digging through the couch for change to go get like cheese bread and stuff like that. Right, right. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was a really cool, you know, way to learn how to do the craft of, you know, comics. Yeah, yeah. So, so you started there and, at, you know, a, a common thing we see is people are like, oh, you're Lee Bermejo. But like in these early days, y you weren't that guy yet. And what, was there a point where it was kind of like, wow, I, I'm, I'm getting paid well, I'm, I'm doing successfully, people know who I am? Or was it all just a slow, gradual? <laughs> yeah, it was just slow and gradual. I mean, mm -hmm. it really, I mean, especially, you know, especially in a place like Wildstorm, there was a hierarchy mm -hmm. of artists because there were mm -hmm. guys who would, were working there for much longer and, and mm -hmm. who had, you know, a talent level that was completely <laughs> another, mm -hmm. you know, on another planet. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, when you're working around guys like, you know, Campbell and Jim mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Travis, there were these guys mm -hmm. there at the time who um, really, like, we weren't even close to doing caliber of work they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, so there was definitely certainly a hierarchy of, mm -hmm. of um, you know, of artists. But I think that was really something that was there to drive, you know, people to try to excel. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I remember they were doing a book called, um, called Voodoo at the time that Alan Moore wrote, actually. Yeah. And, um, the artist who did the first issue, who was a big fan, who I was a big fan of, wound up dropping out of the book for I think deadline reasons. He just wasn't turning in pages, mm -hmm. and I had just started there. And I remember thinking, like, oh my God, like Alan Moore, you know, and, uh, I want to do this book. I want to mm -hmm. do this book. And I remember it was just heartbreaking. Like they were, you know, saying like, you're not really ready to do to do this kind of thing. But mm -hmm. you know, you saw these other guys producing this caliber of work, and you were. Mm -hmm. Was driving you to at least want to achieve that same hmm. level. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was an environment that kind of pushed people to learn, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and working around like the other guys who were who were there at the time, um, Carlos Deanda, Ali Garza, JJ mm -hmm. Kirby, these guys who um, were all working at the studio at the time. We had a lot of fun, you mm -hmm. know, because there was a lot of like healthy competition. <laughs> and you know, guys like JJ, if you drew a bad face or bad hands or something like that, like you would draw on your board. You know, <laughs> like you would come in and there'd be like, you know, I remember once I had um, spent a lot of time working on his face, and um, I remember I came in the next day and the face was erased and there was a try again written in pencil next to it. So, I, and at first I was like, he erased this, you know, I was yeah. furious. But that was the kind of environment, you know, it was, uh, it was really. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm.